Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Show Prize Lecture in Mathematical Sciences by Professor Janos Kala and Professor Claire Fasson, the Show Laureates in Mathematical Sciences 2017. May I first invite Professor Andrew Chan, the head of Shaw College, to deliver his welcoming address. Professor Chan, please. Hi, good afternoon. Professor Kola, Professor Watson, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Shaw College, I would like to welcome you to the Shaw Prize Lecture in Mathematical Sciences 2017. Our close association with Sir Run Run started in 1986. That's the year I joined this university, exact the same year. So I have no choice but to become a Shaw teacher. Because it's a new college, we need a lot of teachers. So every, every newcomers on that particular year, I think nine out of 10 would join Saw, I think. So uh, it's a very important date for me. The college was founded by Sir Raymond also on the same year. In 2002, the establishment of the Shaw Prize was announced. Where? In this same auditorium. So there are a lot of things we can remember. As you know, the Shaw Prize is an international award to honor individuals who are currently active in their respective fields and who have recently achieved distinguished and significant advances, who have made outstanding contributions in academic and scientific research or application, or who in other domains have achieved excellence. The award is dedicated to furthering societal progress enhancing quality of life, and enriching humanity's spiritual civilizations. The Soul Prize consists of three annual awards. They put uh, astronomy first. Perhaps today it would only be right for me to put, put mathematical science first. And then astronomy, life science, and medicine. This year, we are honored to have invited Professor, I don't, uh, let's see if I can pronounce it correctly, Jonas. Yeah. J would not pronounce as J, it's pronounced as practically Y, right? <laughs> Jonas Kola and Professor Department of Mathematics of Princeton University, and also Professor Claire Wozen, Professor Algebraic Geometry Chair College de, de France. Should not be college, it's Courage or something? College. Oh, yeah. I studied French for two years, but uh, only 5% remain. <laughs> the only word remaining is bonjour. <laughs> and uh, this year, we are very happy to have Professor Colin Leung, who sits by the side of our honorable guest from the Department of Mathematics of CUHK. He will introduce our honorable laureates and moderate the Q&A sessions. Uh, the college is deeply honored for having a common benefactor with the Saw Prize, and we are also exceptionally delighted to have the opportunity to learn from the world's foremost scientists and billion minds. May I now pass the time back to our MC, and thank you. Thank you, Professor Chan. May I now invite Professor Colin Nern from the Department of Mathematics, who is our moderator today, to introduce the laureates to us. Professor Lam, please. Thank you. So uh, before I start, let me apologize that uh, I have never learned some Hungarian or uh, fr French before. So some of the pronunciation, uh, I just ch try to guess what is that. <laughs> so uh, Professor Jonas Kola was born in 1956 in Budapest, Hungarian, Hungary, and is currently a professor of mathematics at Princeton University. He obtained his Bachelor of Science from, well, uh, Edelbush, okay, uh, Loran University, Hungary, in 1980, and his PhD from Brandeis University in 1984. Uh, he was a research assistant at the Hungarian Academy of Science from 1980 to 81, 
and junior fellow at Harvard University from 84 to 87. Then he joined the University of Utah, where he successively associate professor from 1987 to 1990, professor from 90 to 1994, and distinguished professor from 94 to 99. From 1999, he moved to Princeton University as professor and was appointed donor professor of science in 19, uh, 2009. And he is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And Professor Claire Wasan was born in 1982 uh, in some place near, near Paris, France. And she is currently a professor, a chair of algebraic geometry at College de France. She obtained a postgraduate teaching diploma in mathematics in 1983 and her PhD from University uh, Bahishri de France in 1986. Then she joined CNRS immediately after graduation in 1986 and continued her career there until 2016. And she was successively researcher at University of Bahishri in Osei, and then Senior Researcher and Director of Research at the Institute of Mathematics, uh, the Yoshi in C CNRS. And she became a professor at the College de France, and she held the Chair of Algebraic Geometry since 2016. She is a member of the Academy of Science in France and Foreign Associate Member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Learn. Now, let us first invite Professor Janos Kala to present his lecture. So, Janos Kala, Professor, please. Um, yeah, so, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, it's a great honor to, to lecture in front of such a distinguished and, and varied audience. Um, so the, 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 the title of my talk, sort of the, so, so the secret title is, is this one, Celestial Surfaces. But, uh, but uh, I assume very few of you have heard about celestial surfaces before. So that's why I gave the more understandable title, which was Circles and Algebraic Surfaces. And so, yes, there will be some pictures that, that uh, there are people, people sent to me or uh, I obtained from them. So I am thankful to them for, for helping me this. And so I am interested in surfaces Really just, you should think a completely ordinary surface and, it's, and special properties that it contains at least two circles passing through every point of the surface. So the, in some sense, the, the, the plan is to try to imagine a, in a very complicated surface that is made up out of the simple objects, which are just circles. Uh, in the old English terminology, these surfaces were called cyclids. So, so if you read the old mathematical literature of the 19th century, then these were frequently called cyclids there. Now, uh, it, it is not hard to, to, to prove that a surface that contains at least, at least two algebraic curves, for instance, just two circles to a general point, that's in fact an algebraic surface. And so that means that we can, we can write down a polynomial in three variables, that the surface is exactly the set of points where this polynomial is just zero. And so now, because of that, I will really consider the algebraic case from now on assume that we have, in fact, a, in fact, a surface that's given 
by an algebraic equation. Uh, the, the story starts probably in 1803 with Dupin with his thesis where he, uh, where he wrote down examples of these surfaces. Then there were some later major development and the work of Kummer uh, and Darbu. And for instance, there is a, there's a fairly long book from, from 1916 by Coolidge, who was at that time the chair of the Harvard Math Department, called the Treatise on the Circle and, and Sphere. So in some sense, this is a very old topic, but, but it's not exactly an accident that so, so, so this is one of the later references. This topic went dormant meant for a while. Uh, now, actually, there, uh, there's an even simpler case. You might ask, well, why just uh, why look at circles? Why not look at lines? So why not look at algebraic surfaces that contain at least two lines through every point? So just close your eyes and try to imagine a, imagine a surface that contains at least two lines through every point. But of course, you might say then there is a flat plane. Yeah? There are lots of, of, of lines there. And now the next example, well, is a plane of the hyperboloid. And it turns out that the first paper that I could find about it, it was written by Sir Christopher Wren, who was the, the architect of St. Paul's Cathedral. But before he started to work in architecture, uh, he was actually a professor of mathematics. And so, and so, so this is the title. Well, uh, I, I don't know whether Latin is still commonly taught uh, around here, but, but sort of this was, was the title. I mean, you, you can see at least, you know, you know, you know hyperbolicity, hyperbolicity. So, so, I mean, it has something to do with hyperboloids. Now, it's in fact very fitting that, that these examples might have been discovered by an architect because, because some of the best new examples of these surfaces, they appear in architecture. So one of the nicest examples I could find is this Kobe Airport Tower, where where you see that if you pick, for instance, from this point here, then there's a straight line moving sort of to the right, a straight line to the left. And now very nicely, the designers even put here these circles. So in fact, here the surface of this tower is an example of a surface where through every point of it, there are two straight lines and even a circle. So it has, so it has some like an even richer uh, geometry. Now, and other examples, the circles are missing here, but the straight lines are there. There's the, the, the there's a TV tower in Sydney. Uh, then I think a more nearby example is the Canton Tower. I think it's a bit unusual shot up. Now, now here the designers decided to keep one set of the straight lines that sort of go left, and instead of the right going in straight lines, they added some interesting thing, spirals. So I think they wanted to, to cre create some, some effect that was, the, that was more unusual. And in, so, so I think that, that from the mathematical point of view, this is, this is not as good as the Kobe Airport Tower, but artistically it creates a new and interesting effect. So all the mathematics can, can, can create some interesting examples. Sometimes an artistic twist can make it even more interesting. Uh, then, well, then there's another example is the art museum here. Now here, well, you, that you look at this, at this facade, then you might say that through every point of it, there are some straight lines. They are the vertical lines, and the horizontal lines 
lines, they are, are, are circles. No, 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 again here, they added a twist to it, so, so that these look more or less like circles, maybe more ellipses, but here they added this interesting thing, thing there. So they changed it a, 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 a little bit. And now, uh, maybe an even more complicated, well, let's hope, yeah, no. okay. So uh, then, well, uh, this is, um, uh, I think from the point of view of my lecture, this is really n n n n not a good example, but, but uh, because, because, because here most of the surface is not curving, there are the, uh, they are really, really, really flat. But if you look at so, uh, just at the front, then you see some to, to do sets that that l looks like they are probably ellipses, and then they have an interesting transition to the the side. So uh, this is a museum in 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 Shanghai. But, and uh, well, this other local example. It's a, it's a vase in the art museum here. Now, and so here it, uh, so you can definitely see the circles here that, that go, go, go around. And now, so I think that the curve, the side of the curve, the way it goes, I, I think this is definitely not as, uh, Circle. It looks like a degree three algebraic curve. So this is is more complicated, uh, but, but, but it's a very a nice example to, to 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 create a grid system on some surface. And and well, I I, 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 I actually try to figure out figure what it says, but. But I could not. So, so I hope it, it says that you should study mathematics because that is very good for your life. And then, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, yes, so what are examples of, of these celestial surfaces? So, again, that contain, contain lots of circles. And so, Again, the simplest examples are just plain because in the plain you can draw lots of circles. Now, then another example is just just spheres. You think about an, an, an orange, no matter how you cut it, you, you get a circle. So there are, again, lots of circles there. Well, well the question is, 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 are there more? And now it turns out that every degree two surface is like that. Well, let's look at the simplest example, which is, well, so if you, 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 you buy some salami, which is some, some long sausage, and now you must have seen it that if you slice it this way, then you get out of it ellipses. Yeah, so they're not circles, they are more flattened. And then I will ask yourself, well, well, what if you sort of buy some salami that's not circular but, uh, uh, but, uh, but elliptical? For instance, you buy a round salami and you just sit on it by accident on the bus. Then you get this elliptical salami. And then if you experiment with it, you will see that, that, that there are precisely two ways to slice an elliptical salami that you get circles. One like this, the other like that. Okay? So uh, if you ever have this, this, this problem, if your salami is given uh, by, by, uh, by, by this equation here, and so it's a nice cylinder, then, then these equations tell you what are the planes that give you precisely circles. So, so this is another application of mathematics to, to making sandwiches. Okay. Uh, now, well, let me do a little theoretical reasons of, of, uh, of what happens. Well, 
So in in R n, but you can th think about it just R three, and you know we normally think about it. We have x y and z coordinates, and well, we can also call them x one, x two, to and x ten. And now we also like to think about it sometimes that we add some points far away out at infinity, so where lines end up. You start with a line, and you think just go on, and if you can go on, on forever, you get a point, and these are the points at infinity. And then at infinity, you can write down what was traditionally called an ideal quadric, and so that its equation, these are the points at infinity, where the sum of the squares of the coordinates is zero. Now, of course, you might say, well, if I start with three numbers and I square them up and I add them, I will not get zero. Ah, but we also have complex numbers. So what happens here, that these ideal points, they come out of complex numbers. That's why they are ideal. They, they don't exist in the actual world. And now, you can easily see that if you have a degree two plane curve, that's a circle if and only if it meets the ideal quadric in, in, in two points. So, so you, you see here that from the real numbers, which we are used to, we really have to go to the complex numbers to understand then what happens. Well, let's just look at, at, at in just two variables. And now then the ideal points are, well, the first coordinate is zero just means that it's infinity. And then we can say one coordinate is one and the other is plus or minus i, where the i is just the square root of minus one. Okay, so that's the thing that may not exist, but you can think of it as an ideal number. That's why it's i. And then if you write down a degree two equations, a general one, then it has this degree, degree two terms. And now this can give you lots of things on things in the plane. It can be an ellipse or a hyperbola or, or a parabola. And, but, but you see that, that this is a circle. Well, what does it mean that it's a circle? Well, the circle equation it does not have this x, y term. And this a and c, they must be the same. And so but, uh, then if you compute the ideal chronic at in, in, in infinity, you substitute this, this is x and this is y, then this will be the only i term and you get that, that a equals c, okay? So, okay, actually maybe this was enough math for a while. Okay, let's do some other interesting example, which is, oops, what happened here? Okay, yes. So let's do another example, and this is the, the torus. You just start with a circle, and you rotate it around. And you see that this torus contains two, two sets of circles, that there are the blue circles on it, and there are the red circles, which we obtained by rotation. So this is one of the celestial surfaces. Now you ask yourself, well, well, I don't know whether you would ask yourself, but you might ask, well, are there some more circles on the torus? Just try to look at it and think about it. Is it possible to put there actually more circles? And now, well, there was a paper about it, uh, written by Antoine Joseph Francois Yvonne Villarceau in 1848. Uh, well, he was a captain in the, the French army. I would think that 1848 is a year that would have kept him busy with, with all the revolutions, but it seems that instead he was thinking about, about, about circles. And then, then so the, here is the picture that there are, in fact, m in fact more circles. So if you are... <laughs> Standing in front of the torus, you have to start with a line that's, that, uh, that's at the front, and it goes up, goes s through the middle hole, and it comes back. Okay, so it's a little bit hard to, to imagine, and you have to check that these are actually circles. Okay? 
Now, well, and so then there are these circles. Now, on the, on the other hand, it turns out that these circles were actually known before. So this is from the Strasbourg Cathedral, which was built around 1300 AD. So, I mean, these cathedrals, it took about 100 years to construct them, so we don't know when exactly. And it's these circles. And so, so it is not the roof. Don't look at the roof. Look at here, these circles that are exactly three examples of these, these uh, Villarso circles. So, so it seems that some stonemasons actually had these examples that was uh, way before. Um, I actually tried to look on the internet if there is some, some very old Chinese art where these circles uh, come up. And I, I am not too good. But if you find examples like this, I would really uh, like to know. As a design element, this really might have been used for you know, maybe even several thousands of of years. Okay. Oh. okay. Okay. Well, and so then let's see how can we we, we can we understand it if we put some, some mathematics on it. But you must ask yourself, well, what is the the torus mathematically? Well, it is sort of made up of two circles. There is the the circle I start with, and then the rotations I go around, that's another circle. So, so, so I think that I, that I start with the circle of radius r, that will be this circle, and then this will be the circle of, of rotations. And then if you want to write down, down the equation, then what do I do? So the, the, that is first circle centered, centered at the origin. Now I have to translate it to the right by b, so the s I have to add b to it. And then multiplying by u and v here, if you think about it a little bit, you will see that that exactly does the rotation. Uh, now, and uh, out of this, you can write down the equation of the, the torus that if you compute x squared plus y squared, then you see that it's u squared plus v squared times s plus b squared, but u squared plus v squared is just one, so this is s plus b squared. So that means as a first approximation, we get this equation, we compute the square, we, 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 we sort of square twice, and then we end up, up with this equation, and this turns out to be the be the key to understanding is that I get x squared plus y squared z, and uh, then we have to square it. And so this is something of degree 4, and this is equal to something of degree 2. Now you see why we like it, because the ideal the, 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 uh, conic is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 0. So that means that every time I see x squared plus y squared plus z squared in an equation, especially if sort of that's the leading term, that gives us the, the degree four term, this is just a lower degree term, then it will have something to do with circles, okay? So maybe this is just a rough guess, but, but that's what we get. Okay, now then, okay, well, let's, actually we are, I, I am a little bit behind time. I, I think I'd rather skip the math because the pictures are probably nicer. And so, okay, let's skip this. Okay, so now, uh, then, so here comes the, come the, 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 the uh, pictures that uh, more or less escape, explain why, where these circles come from. So. I e, e, e imagine that this blue so, you know, so, you know, ellipsoid it, so it shapes, they are the complex versions of uh, what a circle is. And so th there's a circular line that goes, goes around. And uh, then since I have the product of two circles, there is a circle times the circle. And so this UFO-like object is supposed to be uh, are torus. And so these are the real points. And you know, because to, to understand circles, you need to understand 
what happens with the complex number. So these are the real parts. And then all these points here, they represent the, represent the complex points of the torus. Now, these just vertical lines and the horizontal lines, they are the circles that you see on the torus to, to, to start with. They are the obvious examples. Now then, these are the lines uh, that give us the Villarso circles, okay? So, so uh, these are not lines here, but if you compute, it's exactly this one okay. that give us the Villarso circles. Now, you see that everything depends on these, on these four special points, that, and they form the vertices of a. Uh, a square. And so you might ask yourself, well, what happens if I start to move these special points a little bit around? And it turns out, then, then I get some more circles, and the most interesting ones are these. You see that if these four points, they do not lie on a square, then there will be some, some parabola-like like object, so it's not exactly parabola because it's happening in the complex numbers. So there will be, be two of them that pass through all four. If they are the vertices of a square, I could not do that, but as soon as they move into some different position, they can be done. And so let's see some examples where this is actually happens. And so, so that means what you should e imagine that if I start with a torus and I just change it, it change it a little bit, and not arbitrarily, very carefully, but you can change it. And then you can arrange that to every point of the surface, there are act actually six circles. Well, it is just, this is example, just one point. But this is actually a surface where every point of it, there are, are, are six circles. And uh, the, the, then you see when this uh, surface, which is a little bit the form torus, uh, becomes an actual torus, then these two purple ones get closer and closer to each other until they collide. And the same thing, thing happens with the green ones. So, Again, on the torus, it's sort of a special case. Instead of getting six, we get only, only four. Now, here's another example of, of, of sort of the same type of surface. Again, you can see that there, are, that there are six circles through that point. But I would like to emphasize that this is a surface where to every point of it, you can draw there are six points. Now you can ask yourself, of course, whether you can do even more. Well, it turns out that no, that so six is the, is the maximum you can, can achieve. Okay. Uh, now, okay, so let's try to see if, if we can get, get the, the, the E equations because it's nice to so draw these examples though though it, so it is actually very hard to imagine what these surfaces exactly like and and if you draw something on them it is pretty hard to know that you ended up exactly the, the circle and not just something that to, to the naked eye looks like a, like a circle. So that means we really need some equations to, to actually understand what happens. And so these are the examples of the, the, the Darbu cyclids, as I, I said. So, you know, before, uh, when we had, the, when we had the, the torus, I said that this term was equal something degree two that here this is degree two, and that gives you, you the torus. And now we add another term to it. So we keep this very crucial x squared plus y squared plus z squared and just multiply it with something linear. And then these will be the perturbations 
of the torus where there will be six circles. And so you can, can think about it as, as a surface of degree four that contains the, contains the ideal quadric with multiplicity two. So again, if you are not used to imagining the complex numbers, what happens with complex numbers, this is again, again very hard to see. And even I see, see the, the, the equations more than the actual, actual uh, picture. So I'm happy to see in, in, in R3, but you know, if we have three complex variables that, that, that looks like six real variables and it's getting really hard to imagine what happens there. So that means you really need, uh, need equations to understand exactly the, what happens. Now then I would like to end with a, with a few more examples of some of actual buildings with the, that, that were built sort of is so no, no, the same principle, some very interesting surfaces to, to put, to, to, to gather out of two sets of algebraic right, right curves. They can be so in, in the most real life examples, it is not precisely circles. They might look more like ellipses or, or hy hyperbola. So this is a science in Glasgow. Uh, and now this is the Viceroy Hotel in Abu Dhabi. Here again in the roof, you can really see those two sets of ellipses that that uh, our architects imagine. Well, this is a national theater in Beijing, which I hope that many of you, you have seen, especially on the right-hand side of the, the picture. You can very, see, very clearly see in the picture the two sets of ellipses, the horizontal going and the vertical going, going ellipses. This is the uh, roof of the, of the recently redone uh, King's Cross station in, in London. And here at the bottom part, you see sort of two, 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 two hyperbolas, two grids. But if you look at the top, then you see sort of there are these hyperbolas, there are these left going, and there are these vertical like, like hyperbolas. And so that structure is main made up of three hyperbolas. And now uh, this is not an architectural design, but this is a, a, a degree eight surface where there are, there are two circles through every point. And I think that maybe I just end uh, with, 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 with some list of references there, the, the, the some uh, other people, people who have contributed to this. Uh, one reason I, most of my pictures are from architecture because, uh, because two people, three people on the list, and so Potman and also Skopenkov, they actually work at architecture schools. So their main interest is really designing some new shapes that are that are, are, are pleasing and is also reasonably stable. And so the two sets of circles, they contribute to the, the stability of the surface. And so, so, so they, 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 they are hopefully fully useful. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kala. Professor Kala will be joining us again in the Q&A session. And now, let us invite Professor Claire Fassai to present her lecture on projective geometry, chiral geometry, and Hodge theory. I'm very happy to deliver this uh, lecture uh, here. Uh, I'm 
afraid it's, uh, in, it was uh, very hard to, um, to, to decide uh, which will be the, the correct uh, level, but in any case, I, I, what I want to, to do is to speak about um, complex geometry, so there are many different uh, aspects, and um, the, the, the starting point is just uh, linear algebra. Uh, it's, uh, the linear algebra is uh, everywhere, so we, sh we should start with this. So uh, the complex numbers are uh, made of two uh, real numbers. Uh, so, and, um, and so there is a number i with uh, i squared equal minus one, and then you compute uh, using the, this equation, you compute the product of two uh, com complex numbers. And there is also the trigonometric, trigonometric approach where you see multiplication by a complex number as uh, adding uh, the, 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 the angle, uh, so the, the, which is the argument of your complex number, and uh, multiplying by the, 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 the modulus of your complex number. Now, what is important is the fact that the complex numbers are a field, and you can do uh, a linear algebra over this field. That is the theory of complex vector spaces. Uh, when you have a complex vector space uh, of dimension uh, n, uh, you, you restrict the scalar multiplication to, to, to the real numbers, and you get a real vector space, and it has now dimension 2n, because if you had a, a basis uh, e1 to en for your complex vector space, then e1 i e1, i e1, e2 i e2, etc., will form a basis over r of, the, of your v. And now, what, what happens if I go in, in the other, other direction? Suppose I, I start from a real vector space, necessarily of even dimension, and I want to, 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 to have some extra structure which makes it into a complex vector space. For this, I, I, I already have the scalar multiplication by the real, so I just have to know the multiplication by the number i. And this is just the, the data of an of endomorphism of your vector space which has to satisfy the equation uh, i squared equal minus identity. Uh, that uh, viewpoint does not uh, tell you something which is very interesting, which is the fact that the set of complex structures, or structures of complex vector space on a given real vector space, this is itself uh, uh, what is called a complex manifold. And this is better seen if you look at the, the, the second, uh, the, 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 this uh, last uh, uh, representation, that uh, uh, a complex, vector, uh, uh, complex structure on your vector space is determined by the, the data of, uh, of a complex vector space inside your V, which is complexified to C. So your R to N is uh, complexified into C to N, and if you choose a, a vector space inside, uh, which is of dimension N, you, you, you will determine a complex structure on your uh, V. Okay, so that was uh, for uh, linear algebra. Uh, and now let, let me go to more, uh, to, uh, more uh, of course, uh, advanced uh, things, uh, namely uh, analysis involving uh, complex uh, numbers. So when you, when you have a differentiable map from, a, say, an open set of uh, R2 to, uh, to, an up, to, to C, that is to R2, uh, so suppose that it is a differentiable, you, you, you will say that it is uh, uh, holomorphic if the differential, which is a linear map at, uh, at any given point Z, the differential is a linear map from R2 to R2, and you want it to be uh, C linear. So that means that the differential at any point is a multiplication by a complex number. So, and you see that uh, uh, it's all, sometimes it's also called a conformal map because that means that the differential at any point uh, it, it uh, preserves uh, the angles. So, uh, are there many such uh, holomorphic functions? In fact, uh, yes and no. Uh, typically, the, the polynomials of one complex variable they, they are uh, holomorphic. And uh, it is a consequence of a very important result uh, called the uh, Cauchy formula that, uh, in fact, uh, the, all the holomorphic functions are so-called uh, complex analytic, which means that uh, they are, if you like, uh, uniform uh, limits of uh, complex uh, polynomials. Uh, they are the sum of, the, of their Taylor series. This is a real analytic. But furthermore, the Taylor series is, uh, is a, a, a series of the complex variable. Okay. And uh, uh, I work in uh, complex algebraic geometry, uh, and, uh, but uh, complex algebraic geometry can be extended to, to analytic uh, geometry. 
Uh, in algebra and geometry, where the functions we will consider are uh, polynomials or uh, fractions or um, well, so they are called uh, algebraic functions. And in analytic geometry, we will consider more generally analytic functions in uh, this, uh, this sense. So now I would will, I will like to say, um, so that was uh, completely uh, local, and now I would like to say something about a notion which is very important uh, in all, all various areas of uh, geometry, namely the notion of, uh, of a manifold. Uh, so uh, a general topological space, we, we don't really don't have a good uh, notion of what it is, but we like uh, those spaces which uh, locally look like the ambient space. So we like to have uh, local uh, coordinates. And uh, the, the good picture is uh, that of, uh, of an atlas, where, where, uh, which is made of uh, various uh, charts that, uh, that admit uh, some uh, overlaps, and all together they will cover your, uh, your space. So, so, so this is a, so, and, and uh, your given topological space, which is a local, which has a local uh, such uh, chart, it will be called so. Uh, it will be called the manifold uh, if uh, um, differentiable manifold if the, 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 the maps of uh, change of, of uh, charts are uh, differentiable. Uh, so uh, by this I mean uh, that uh, you. Um, you, you have these uh, local charts, but of course they, they overlap. On the, on the intersection of two, uh, two charts, we have uh, two sets of uh, coordinates. Uh, so, the, the, for example, here you have the, the, red, the red chart and the blue uh, chart. On the overlap, you, you, you can express the new coordinates uh, as functions of the, of the old coordinates. And the, the differentiable manifolds are those for which these, uh, these expressions are differentiable. And the complex manifold, uh, it's uh, exactly the same idea, except that we want more uh, regularity. The, the local chart will be uh, with value in open set of uh, C to the N. And what we want is that the, the change of uh, coordinate maps are uh, holomorphic. So now uh, the interest of this notion is that uh, it's a, a global uh, viewpoint on an object that we, we don't understand them uh, uh, usually very well. I, I, I will explain uh, what, uh, what, um, what are the combinatorics, which gives uh, some idea of, uh, about uh, what looks like the space uh, globally. And can ask, are there so many uh, uh, compact complex manifold. So, um, so let me say why um, uh, I can say already why compact is important in this setting. There is a sort of uh, contradiction between uh, holomorphic and, uh, and compact, which is due to the fact that um, um, uh, the, the maximum uh, principle tells you that when a holomorphic function, uh, when, um, a holomorphic function can reach the, the maximum of its uh, modulus, uh, at a point if, uh, on if it is locally constant near that point. Now, if you are on a compact uh, manifold, uh, you, uh, any holomorphic function will uh, reach the, the maximum of its uh, modulus, and so the conclusion is that it will be, in fact, uh, constant, uh, constant on, the, on the connected component. So because of this, uh, finding, constructing compact complex manifold is not an easy uh, task. But uh, the, the good example is um, the, the case of uh, complex, uh, complex tori. So uh, Janusz mentioned already the, the two-dimensional real uh, torus. So uh, the, I, I will consider only uh, even-dimensional uh, uh, tori. Uh, uh, they are obtained as follows. So you, 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 you start with uh, uh, the real vector space R to N, and you identify two points whenever the, their co coordinates differ by, uh, by integral numbers. So you can imagine in dimension two, you have a, parallel, uh, a parallelogram, and uh, you, you have to identify the, the, the parallel uh, sides. So that, that will give you exactly the picture what, uh, that was uh, shown by uh, Janos. Namely, uh, the, the, the first two opposite sides will give you identifying them 
will give you a cylinder, and then you have also to identify the two, the two other parallel sides, and your cylinder will glue to this uh, nice picture of, uh, that was shown uh, abundantly by, uh, by uh, Yanosh. So, um, and now, why uh, it's very easy to, to, um, to put a complex structure on such an uh, object? And, uh, it's because uh, you just have to, so you, you have your, your question, R2N over Z2N, you just choose a, a complex structure on your space R2N. That is, uh, you, you make it, you decide it is a complex vector space, as explained in the previous uh, slide. And then uh, uh, that, that, uh, that put uh, a complex structure, a structure of a complex uh, manifold on the, the quotient, uh, simply because, uh, well, I want to, uh, to check uh, that my definition is correct. Uh, your, your torus, uh, to, to, uh, to have a system of charts on it, you just uh, start from a, a, small, a small chart in R2N, small enough so that no two points uh, are, uh, are coordin uh, coordinates which differ by an integer. Okay? So this, this, char this chart will be give you an open set in your, uh, in your quotient. And then you, you, will, uh, you will cover the, the whole torus by just moving the, 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 the chart by translating it uh, over R to N. And uh, so that gi will give you an atlas. And the, the change of coordinate map for this atlas are just translations. And the translations, they are holomorphic. And so that gives you a structure of a compact complex manifold. Now I, I want to say something about the projective geometry. And uh, the reason for projective geometry, the projective geometry is a very old field, and uh, so also in some sense related to, to art. Uh, uh, maybe Janos could have mentioned this, um, because it is related to perspective, etc. But the reason why I want to do projective geometry here, it's exactly related to the problem of uh, compactness and complex geometry. It's because if you work with, in the real, uh, the real setting, the embedding, uh, embedding problem for a real manifold will be to, to embed your manifold uh, as, uh, inside some ambient space uh, R to the N, uh, for N large. But as I, as I, as I explain uh, in the complex setting, uh, if you start from a compact complex manifold, there is no, uh, you cannot uh, uh, embed it holomorphically into C to the N because there are, not, uh, uh, there are no non-constant uh, holomorphic functions. So for us, the, the, the embedding problem will be uh, to embed our compact uh, complex manifold inside some projective space, complex uh, projective space. And, and complex projective space, it is uh, the ambient space in particular for uh, algebraic uh, geometry. So what it is, as, as I said, uh, you consider the set of, uh, so the CPN, the set of uh, complex lines in, uh, in CP, uh, in, uh, sorry, there is a, a, a typo, in C to the N plus one, so the one dimensional complex vector uh, species. And uh, uh, this is, uh, you can see this as a compactification of, uh, of uh, C, of the affine space C to the N. So here I made a, a picture representing the, the two-dimensional real projective space. So uh, if you have a line in, uh, in R3, so you, you choose a linear coordinate, say Z. And so that gives you an affine uh, hyperplane, Z equal 1. On, uh, inside R3, and most lines in R3, they will meet this affine space is exactly one point. So they will have a one generator with uh, Z equal one. But there are missing lines, which are the horizontal lines. So those which are in contained in the hyperplane Z equal zero. And this, they, they form uh, what, what is called the circle at infinity. And the complex analog of this is complex projective space where you have to add to C to the N the, the complex projective space of lines uh, contained in, in C to the N, that is a copy of uh, CP, uh, CP to the N minus one. And the projective, um, projective manifolds, uh, those are, uh, um, uh, a priori, uh, you, there are several ways to define them, but a priori, you, we, we will consider the, the, closed, uh, uh, closed, the closed analytic uh, submanifolds of, um, or complex submanifolds of projective space. So that is uh, locally defined by uh, holomorphic equations. And uh, there is a wonderful result by Cho, which has been generated, uh, generalized later on by, uh, 
by uh, Jean-Pierre Serre, uh, which says that, in fact, uh, with uh, the, the, the objects that, that we get, they are uh, algebraic, that is, the equation, they, they admit global algebraic equations, uh, vanishing of them and then uh, defining uh, them. So I should say something about the fact that the equations are uh, homogeneous, uh, polynomials, etc. But it's already uh, really uh, remarkable that uh, starting from the, the complex an analytic setting, we, uh, we find, finally we are back to the algebraic geometry uh, setting. I have a problem with uh, <laughs> the timing. So um, now I, uh, I completely go back to something which is, uh, which is uh, really different. Uh, when doing uh, complex geometry, uh, things are extremely regular because holomorphic functions, as I said, they are, they are extremely regular, they are, they are analytic. And, uh, and even uh, in the algebraic geometry setting, they are uh, algebraic, which is still more uh, regular. But uh, uh, at the beginning of everything, we have a topological notion, and it could make sense of a topological manifold, for example. And uh, as I said, globally, what we are faced when we consider the, the, the topology, uh, it, it, um, uh, it's uh, a sort of a skeleton uh, which uh, tells you whether your, uh, your topological space can, more or less can be uh, continuously contracted to a point. Or, uh, uh, and, uh, so, uh, so there are obstructions to that, and there are uh, 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 quantities, or, uh, well, uh, what, the topological invariant, which allow to, to solve uh, very simple questions, like uh, consider these two surfaces, the, 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 the red, which which is again the, the torus, the torus with the one, uh, one uh, hole, and uh, the, the red, the, the green uh, surface, uh, which is a sort of uh, the torus, but now with two, two holes. Uh, so uh, now, just topologically, uh, how, how will we prove that these two surfaces are not homeomorphic? Homeomorphic, that, is, that means that top, uh, topologically, just considering continuous functions, they are the same. Or, if you prefer, uh, why, uh, why, uh, how to prove that these two surfaces cannot be deformed to, to continuously to one to each other uh, without cre creating a singularity? I, everybody feels it's clear because one has a one hole and the other has two holes, but how to make it into, uh, into mathematics? Uh, the, the, they were invariant, uh, several kinds, but the simplest ones are the, called uh, the, single, the, the homology or cohomology. So for example, uh, here uh, what I describe is more or less a singular um, homology. Uh, here, what uh, the, the picture shows a, 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 a closed one-dimensional uh, singular uh, chain. It is made of, uh, of segments. And you, you arrange the segments so that uh, their boundaries uh, cancel uh, each other in such a way that finally you, 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 what you have is a, is a closed, uh, it's a loop. And uh, so uh, on the left, you, you, you get uh, this, uh, this uh, one-dimensional chain, a closed one-dimensional uh, chain. And uh, on the right, what I picture is uh, the image of a boundary. So you, you have a, you have inside of uh, your, uh, your, uh, your surface of genus 2, uh, you have uh, this, uh, this contour uh, capital gamma. Uh, you need uh, orientations to make sense of this. This capital gamma, it has a boundary. Uh, the, correct, uh, the correct definition should involve uh, singular chains or triangulations or things like that. But here, the, what is the boundary is, uh, is clear. The, the, there are the, the three circles, the three red uh, circles, uh, which will be uh, oriented. And then, uh, in, in the theory, we will consider uh, the closed chains and uh, mod them out by uh, the boundary. So, uh, so in, the, in that theory, uh, you, we have the equation that uh, um, the, the boundary of capital gamma is uh, gamma 1 minus gamma 2 minus gamma 3. The signs as a dependent orientation so one has to be uh, slightly uh, careful. And out of this, one constructs uh, groups which are attached to these varieties, to these, uh, to these uh, uh, topological species. And typically, on the left, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the group that we get. It is uh, Z2. And on the right, the group that we get is uh, Z4. So they are not uh, the same groups. And so the... the 
the objects are not, uh, these two species are not uh, homeomorphic. Uh, it's, it's nice because uh, the, the question seems to be a question in analysis, and finally we solve it by um, something which is uh, rather algebraic. Okay, so, so that was uh, the, the viewpoint of, uh, of pure topology, so without any regularity. And uh, a fundamental result uh, uh, proved in the, in the 30s uh, is uh, the Durham theorem, which says that if you are on a manifold, where you have some uh, differentiable functions, differential forms, you can compute the same topological invariant, almost the same, using differential forms. So here it's, uh, you need, uh, of course, uh, not many uh, notions of, uh, of uh, say basically, uh, calculus. Uh, the important point is that uh, of, uh, of, of a differential form and exterior differential. Out of this, you, uh, you construct uh, the so-called Durham cohomology groups, where, where you consider in degree k, the, the k forms which are closed, modulo the k form which are the, which are exact that is uh, the, the total differential of uh, of, uh, of forms of degree uh, k minus 1 and the, the, now the, there is a stokes uh, formula so i am presenting things in uh, anti chronological uh, order uh, in fact, uh, I, th I think that in some sense the, 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 the theory of differential forms and, uh, was uh, appeared much earlier in, uh, in mathematics uh, via, in particular, uh, uh, physics. Uh, but, um, of course, the, 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 the idea of, uh, of a BT singular homology were essential to understand uh, the fact that uh, these quantities have a topological character rather than a differentiable character. So the Stokes formula tells you that uh, when you have a, 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 a contour in uh, say capital gamma in your, in your manifold, so reasonably uh, different, uh, differentiable, you, and you have a, a differential form, alpha, uh, so the, the gamma is a contour of dimension k, the alpha is a form of degree k minus 1, so when you take d alpha, you get a form uh, which is of degree k, and then you can integrate it, so your, the gamma needs to be oriented, uh, and, uh, uh, but the integral that you get, it is the same thing as uh, uh, taking first the boundary of the contour, now it's something of dimension k minus 1, and integrating over it the alpha. And what, uh, well, this formula is of course crucial in, uh, everywhere, but in uh, the, the viewpoint of topology on this, is, is the fact that then, if you, if you have a, a, a closed a, a singular chain inside uh, your, uh, your differentiable manifold uh, and a closed uh, k-form on, on your differentiable manifold, the integral of the, of the closed k-form on the, on the closed uh, k-chain uh, is, uh, is uh, something which, which depends only on the homology class of your gamma, so you can deform your gamma and you add a boundary to it, and it depends also only on the on the class, the homology class of your alpha. Um, that is, you can add to alpha an exact form without changing the result. And uh, so we, we say there is a pairing between uh, the RAM uh, cohomology and uh, and uh, homology. And one way of formulating the Durham theorem is to say that uh, if you have a closed k-form on your differentiable manifold, it is exact if and only it, if it's only of its integral over closed uh, contours, k-dimensional contours, in, um, or k -dimension, closed k-dimensional chains, on, uh, in x are, uh, are zero. Uh, now, there is a, the fact that, uh, the, of course, the Durham theory, a priori, it is not good to compute uh, the invariant with uh, coefficients in Z or Q, like, a Betty, uh, uh, like in the Betty cohomology. Uh, so, um, but still, uh, with the Durham, uh, this Durham result, we can uh, define a, a cohomology close, a class to be real uh, if uh, all of its integrals over closed contours are uh, rational. Um, um, I say that a closed k form has a rational cohomology class if all of its integrals over closed uh, contours are uh, rational uh, numbers. So it's uh, the, the, the good, um, well, it's, it's uh, I would say it's uh, the ad hoc definition uh, because, for example, uh, 
Um, it does not give uh, the, the right notion of uh, an integral cohomology class, for example. But it's a, it's a way of uh, formulating this. So I, I, had, uh, I, had, uh, I have been back to, to topology, and now I come back to the, the complex setting where I, I gain a lot of uh, regularity. So what happens to the, the, Durham, uh, the Durham complex of uh, differential forms in the complex uh, setting? That on, on a complex manifold, you have the notion of a form of type PQ. Uh, form of, forms of type 1, 0, they are the, 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 the linear form on the tangent space, which are C linear at any point. And more generally, the forms of type uh, PQ, they are those which can be uh, written in uh, local uh, holomorphic coordinates uh, Z as uh, combinations of uh, monomials uh, DZI wedge DZG bar, so uh, where the cardinality of I is uh, P, exactly P, and the cardinality of, uh, of G is exactly uh, Q. So this is uh, the, the multi-index notation where for each I, which is a set of indices, the, the, the DZI is the, the wedge product of the DZK for K uh, in this uh, set. And the beta IG here, this would be the, just uh, say, uh, complex uh, valued uh, differential, different, um, differentiable functions. And it's an important point that uh, um, a complex, uh, if you are on a complex manifold, uh, a, compl uh, a complex differential form, beta, can be written uh, uniquely as a direct sum of uh, form, form of uh, forms of type uh, PQ. But uh, the, the, the a big problem in, to understand the, the topology of, uh, of complex manifolds, even the compact complex manifold, is the fact that this, uh, this decomposition is not compatible with the exterior differential. So because of this, uh, it, uh, it's very hard to understand what, what are the, the topological uh, restrictions on so what are what are the restrictions on the topology of compact complex manifold? Uh, uh, so you have this uh, you have this Durham complex. Uh, it has this decomposition, but because it uh, it has nothing to do with uh, well, not much to do with the differential exterior differential. It's, uh, it's hard to analyze the, the constraints that you get by considering the RAM cohomology. But um, the, the main result uh, on this does not concern general compact complex manifold, but uh, compact Keller manifold. Keller manifold, I am not going to say what it is, but these are comp uh, complex manifolds which admit um, uh, metrics uh, which are highly compatible with a complex structure. Uh, so um, there are uh, Hermitian metrics, but more uh, if you want to understand what, i what is a compact, uh, what is a Keller manifold from the view viewpoint of a Riemannian geometry, uh, there are those for which the, um, the, the tensor of uh, almost complex structures, uh, this uh, capital I which describes uh, the complex structure on the tangent space at any point, this tensor is, uh, is parallel for the levi uh, connection. And uh, now, uh, projective manifolds, they are, um, they are Keller, uh, because the projective space itself has a Keller metric. So uh, everything that is contained in projective space is also Keller. And, and the Hodge theorem tells you that uh, if you are on a compact Keller manifold, any closed form, uh, alpha, uh, can be written as the sum of uh, an exact form and a uh, uh, form of, of type PQ, uh, which are closed. So uh, it's not true that any, for, any closed form alpha is a sum of closed form of type PQ. It's exactly the problem that I mentioned before. But that becomes true modulo adding an exact form, which does not change the cohomology uh, class. And, uh, and uh, furthermore, in that uh, statement, the, the cohomology class, the Durham cohomology class of each uh, closed form beta PQ is determined by the class of alpha. And there is another way to, uh, to state uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, result. So you, you start from your, your, your projective or compact Keller manifold. You, so for each, uh, so, so for each uh, set of uh, pairs of integers, P and Q, you have the, the subspace HPQ of X, which is uh, uh, contained in a uh, cohomology of degree P plus Q of X with complex coefficients. So this is but defined as this is a complex vector space made of cohomology classes of closed forms of, uh, of type uh, PQ. 
So uh, another way to, to, to say the, to phrase the, 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 this uh, Hodge theorem is to, is, is to say that the, this cohomology the space HK of XC, it is a direct sum uh, over all pairs of PQ such that P plus Q is equal K of uh, the, the HPQ uh, space. And in between, I wrote uh, 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 HK of XC, so this is called the, the change of coefficient theorem, The, as I said, as I explained uh, by, uh, by Durham, we know that uh, complex, uh, complex cohomology, it has a uh, rational structure, so it can be written as rational cohomology tensor uh, C. So it's a complexification of a uh, rational vector space. Okay, and there is an extra, uh, an, an extra condition in that uh, definition, namely that um, when you consider, so inside uh, this, uh, so uh, here's the space that you get, so the, this is Uh, rational vector space tensor C. On it, the complex conjugation acts naturally because it acts on the coefficient uh, C. And uh, now this complex conjugation, it extends the, the PQ form with the QP form. And uh, with this definition, you conclude that the, the complex conjugate of HQP is, uh, is uh, the HPQ. So, and all this data together, they form uh, what, what uh, has been called by, saying by uh, Griffiths, um, uh, uh, rational Hodge structure of weight uh, K. Okay. This is uh, extraordinary because it's a definition where you have only linear algebra. But this linear algebra is uh, rather subtle because you have a notion from, a, uh, you, you start from a Q vector space that might be even a, a lattice that is a, 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 an abelian group. Uh, so if you want to, to have an integral Hodge structure, then you complexify and inside you have this moving vector uh, species. So uh, to, to explain the, uh, how, how deep is uh, this notion, if you have a, a weight one Hodge structure, um, Well, or the weight one Hodge structure associated to the, the, the by Hodge uh, to the, the, the cohomology of a uh, one-dimensional complex torus, it is called an elliptic curve. It, it determines the elliptic curve. This is called the, the, the tau invariant, and uh, it it, uh, it sees how the, your uh, your elliptic curve as a complex uh, manifold deforms. Uh, so this is a, the, the equivalent data. And uh, I, just, I just want to explain an example of uh, what uh, can be done with, uh, with a Hodge, um, Hodge structure. So, uh, when, uh, so I, I, there was this notion of, uh, of a Keller metric, so I did not explain very much, but associated to the Keller metric, of course it's a metric, so there, uh, there is a part which is a symmetric tensor, which gives you actually the metric, but there is an imaginary part which is a two-form, and it is a, a real closed of type 1-1 uh, in the sense that I, uh, that I said. So it has, but because it is a closed form, it has a cohomology class, uh, which is um, a real cohomology class of type 1-1. Uh, And um, maybe the most important uh, result of, uh, of a complex uh, algebraic geometry is uh, the Kodaira uh, embedding theorem, which uh, characterizes uh, the, um, the, the compact Keller manifolds, which can be embedded in projective space, so which are, uh, which are projective. And the statement is this, uh, that a compact Keller manifold is projective if and only if it has a, a Keller form whose cohomology class uh, is, uh, is a rational cohomology class. So, and then, what is, uh, what is the difficulty to, to embed this uh, general compact uh, Keller manifold into projective space? The problem is that we, as says Kodaira, we only need to find a, a, a Keller class which is rational. But if you look at the, so, uh, what the, the picture here, it, uh, it shows you the, the Hodge decomposition um, in degree two on, uh, on real cohomology. So then the H2, will split into a part which is made of, a, of a classes of type 1-1 and the rest which is made of real parts of classes of type 2-0. So you have this decomposition and the Keller classes, they must be in the 1-1 part. Now inside your real cohomology, You, you have a rational cohomology. It is everywhere. Q is dense in R. So all the, the dots here, the, 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 the dense cloud of uh, rational points. The problem is that your space H11, it's not defined over the rational, so it, it, might, not, it might not contain any 
rational cohomology class. So the only thing you have to do in order to be able to, uh, to maybe to deform your, uh, your complex manifold into one which will embed in projective space is to deform the complex structure uh, in such a way that this Hodge decomposition uh, deforms a little and, and uh, that you catch a rational cohomology class which is uh, of type 1-1. One, one. Of course, you need it to be positive, killer, etc. But that's the main, the main difficulty. And indeed, Kodaira proved uh, that uh, for surfaces, so for curves, I should have said that for, for, um, for uh, compact um, one-dimensional complex manifolds, so the, there is uh, the Riemann embedding theorem, for surfaces, uh, Kodaira proved that any compact Keller surface can be deformed into a projective one. So exactly this picture that we have, uh, we can deform a little and catch one of these rational points. And I proved that uh, in higher dimension, at least uh, starting from dimension, uh, dimension, complex dimension four, this is not possible. Uh, there are topological obstructions to do that. There are compact Keller manifolds, which are not uh, homeomorphic to any uh, complex projective manifold, and there is in particular no hope to, to deform the complex structure into uh, something which is embeddable in, in the complex projective space. And the, the, to finish, the, the, the obstruction to, to, to do this, it is of a topological nature. It's, uh, it is by looking at the, the so-called cohomology algebra of your, uh, of your compact Keller manifold. And uh, there are uh, obstructions of which are rather delicate, but uh, which uh, only uh, use uh, the, the algebra of uh, uh, linear algebra and the notion of Hodge structures, as, uh, as I explained um, before. I will stop. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor Vassan. And please remain on stage. And you can take a seat first. And may we now invite Professor Kala and Professor Learn, please also come up to the stage to join Professor Vassan for the Q&A session. All right, so uh, after these two lectures, and uh, the following session is an is a, uh, open forum that uh, I think this is a very, very special and rare opportunity for all our uh, students, or it could be high school students, undergraduate students, or even graduate students, or anyone on the, on, on the floor, to have uh, uh, any questions about mathematics or being mathematicians, uh, to ask uh, uh, on the, uh, any, of this, uh, any of the two uh, uh, Charles Lawrence. Yeah? And uh, any question would be welcome, yeah. Yes, over there? Uh, over there. So what's your advice? What kind of things uh, he or she should read or study? For undergraduate students who, who want to study algebraic mm -hmm. geometry, yeah? And uh, where to start, yeah. And so I think for algebraic geometry, you have to start with some algebra. And so, <laughs> so you have to take a something like a standard algebra course, and then to learn some commutative algebra. One of the best starting books in commutative algebra was written by Atia and McDonald some lo 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 long time ago. Uh, it's actually always a good idea if you study a subject at the beginning from a book that's written uh, by a non-expert. So Atia is best known for being a, a to to topologist and a differential geometer. And so when he writes about commutative algebra, then he covers the topics that, that are really of interest to everyone. Whereas when an algebraist writes about algebra, then they just write various crazy things that algebraists have been thinking about. Claire? So, so I, I don't like very much to give uh, advices, but um, I, I will give uh, maybe the opposite uh, advice. <laughs> <laughs> that is, um, uh, me, I, 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 I read the book by Atian McDonald before I started algebraic geometry. And I didn't really see what uh, what the use uh, to to geometry 
Uh, it was uh, when I read the book by uh, Hartshorn, Introduction to Algebraic Geometry, that I, I uh, understood uh, the, the very the importance of uh, the in algebraic geometry, the, the topological space, the, the points are, the, the, so there is a notion of uh, the spectrum of uh, rings, so the points are ideals. Um, in uh, or prime uh, ideals in a ring, so, and uh, the, the, um, it's only later on that I came back to the, this uh, Tia McDonald uh, book. As, uh, there is another excellent book, which is uh, by Matsumura, for example, which may, may also, uh, well, it's also, very, also very nice. Maybe you, you see a little more uh, uh, geometry than in uh, Tia McDonald. But um, uh, me, I, I started also very much from, uh, from geometry. Um, uh, I always liked uh, topology, so I started with a book uh, by Milnor uh, about uh, Morse theory, uh, where he speaks about uh, Riemannian geometry. Then I uh, read the book by uh, André Veil, an introduction to, uh, to Keller geometry, that was more in the analytic setting. Each time, uh, so I, uh, I felt that maybe uh, the theory is wonderful, but uh, I don't, um, does not really see uh, what are the objects. And then finally, I, uh, I came to algebraic geometry. And what is wonderful in algebraic geometry is that uh, the, the objects, they are there. Maybe, maybe even there are too many of them. Um, so if you look at, the, if, if you read the book by Veil on, on Keller, uh, Keller manifolds, it is very well written in the, this uh, French style. Very, you have, uh, but uh, you, you, it's not very alive, and uh, there might be a, not a single example of a Keller, <laughs> Keller manifold in, in it. So, but in any case, I, uh, I did the thing in that uh, direction, uh, uh, coming from um, more from uh, differential geometries and passing through analytic geometries and coming to, to algebraic geometry. And then more and more, of course, this is uh, at, uh, at the beginning that was maybe complex algebraic geometry. But that does not make sense to study complex algebraic geometry separately because, uh, you, you see, you, you, in algebraic geometry, you study polynomials, so there is no reason to restrict uh, to, to complex coefficients. It's very important. So, uh, for, for example, the, the work of, uh, of Mori shows that uh, uh, being able to, to work as well uh, with uh, polynomials with uh, coefficients in a f finite field, for example, and it's very important. So, um, so of course, you can do more and more algebraic things. And that was the way I, uh, <laughs> the way I did it. And so I completely agree with Professor Warzen that if your plan is to read five long books at the very beginning, then follow her advice. If your plan is to start with one slim book, I still think Atiyah McDonald is the best start. <laughs> All right, very good advice. <laughs> Any other? Yes, yeah, there's uh, somebody in the middle. Uh, I have a question for Professor Vazal. Uh, you mentioned the, the Kodaira uh, embedding theorem. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is there an intuitive way to understand how the topological, uh, topological property to decide uh, whether the Keller manifold can embed in the projective space. So I am not sure you, uh, you, you want me to explain uh, the reason for the, uh, the criterion in, in the Kodaira theorem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, I, 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 if I had more time, I would explain this. It's very crucial. Uh, it's exactly related to the problem I said. Uh, there is no, uh, there is no um, non-constant uh, global holomorphic function on a compact complex manifold. But uh, what we can do so on, on, complex, uh, on complex projective space, uh, so we, we, this is the same situation. But over complex uh, projective space, uh, if you look at the definition, there is, uh, what we say line bundle, that is over each point there is a line, a complex line. Uh, namely, it's precisely because uh, the complex projective space it parameterizes vector lines in C to the n plus one. So you put all these lines, uh, and, and the, the total space of this gives you uh, a complex manifold uh, whose, uh, whose base is uh, the projective space. And the fibers, they are uh, complex lines. 
And on this, on the, in fact, the, the total space, it is, uh, if you add the zero, uh, yes, uh, the, the total space, is, is essentially, it is uh, C to the, in, C to the n plus one, it's not completely correct, but it's basically this. And, uh, and so now the, the natural way of uh, looking at uh, an embedding of an X into uh, complex projective space is to say what we want on the X is to have similarly a line bundle. Uh, uh, the total space should be a whole, uh, com uh, complex manifold. And uh, upstairs, the, the total space of this line bundle should map holomorphically to C to the N, to the N plus one. Uh, and the, the thing should be, uh, the, so over the fibers, uh, we should just have an embedding of a complex line to complex line. And um, there is, uh, that means that what you have to do is to find a complex uh, uh, hol uh, holomorphic uh, line bundle, that is a holomorphic family of a complex line, and you want that on the total space, there are holomorphic, uh, true holomorphic functions mapping to C to the N plus one. So you want something, uh, something uh, to actual functions, holomorphic functions, on the total space of the line bundle, and uh, by, the, by taking the quotient via sister action, you will get your map from projective space, from, uh, from uh, your x, compact x, to, to projective space. So this is a picture that we have, and so for the, the Kodaira embedding theorem, we, we, we have to find already the, this uh, holomorphic line bundle. But a holomorphic line bundle, forget about the holomorphic, the, the word holomorphic, and just keep complex. So that now, uh, what is a complex, uh, a co a complex uh, topological line model? Uh, it's the same as a, topologically, topologically as a, an oriented uh, rank to uh, real vector bundle. For, for, some, for, for some easy reason. And, and such object uh, has a, a topological invariant, which is a, uh, it's a Euler class, uh, and we, we call it sometimes uh, the first chain class of, uh, of the line bundle. And this is this class which will be the, the, in fact it should be integral, which will be the class which is needed in Kodaira theorem. So I, I, I will say that the, in the Kodaira embedding theorem, there is an easy direction, is that the condition is necessary uh, and the, the hard di direction, which, uh, which gave the, the Fields medal to Kodaira, is the other direction that the condition is sufficient. So in any case, so the, the topologically, the reason that we, we, we have a, compl a complex line bundle, and even holomorphic is not necessary to, to, um, to, to produce the integral cohomology class. When it is holomorphic, you conclude that the, the, the chain class is of type 1-1, and this is also uh, part of the necess necessary condition. So, uh, so I think the, the intuition is very strong. I mean, the, the, we know exactly why, uh, why the, the, the condition is necessary. If you have not uh, completely understand, you should ask her uh, afterward, too. Yeah. How about other uh, questions like for undergraduate students or even high school students? Uh, Maybe something slightly not as technical. Like someone, some question about the architecture. Is there one? So, yeah, over there. Yeah. Uh, have you ever think of uh, giving up math? If yes, and and what what makes you giving on in uh, keep going in mathematics? C can you repeat the question? Oh, oh, oh. Again? Um, have you ever want to give up mathematics? And and if yes, and what's what's the thing that Keep, um, Have you ever mm. wanted to give up mathematics? <laughs> you mean for, I mean, uh, not to give up, you mean after the, the, the prize or before the prize? <laughs> um, and so, I th think I never wanted to give it up completely, <laughs> but, but, uh, there are frequently times when I, when I feel that, um, that, 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 that I have just done, done too much math. It sort of it occupies my mind too much, and I need to actually free my mind somehow. And so then uh, so sometimes the easiest is I try to go, for instance, on a long bicycle ride. It's, 
it's, it's, it's sort of hard enough that, and I have to think about the traffic, it can, that it can really relax my mind. And, and uh, sometimes I try to go on a long hike, maybe, maybe hike for several days and, 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 and really try not to think about, uh, about mathematics, so just, so just to do something else. And, uh, and uh, then I always do this with the idea that at some point I will feel that I should think about mathematics again. And so far this always happened after a few days. So I don't know what will happen if once after two months I still feel I, that I prefer to just hike more. So I will let you know if this happens. <laughs> so how about Claire? Have you? Um, so me, most of the time I, I feel totally desperate. <laughs> Uh, because I find uh, the, the doing maths is uh, very hard, and uh, you know you have an, an idea uh, maybe uh, once or twice, uh, twice a year, and the rest of the time you you just simply you don't know what you are doing. Uh, but finally, uh, in fact, I, I don't know. Um, I have no other ability, so it's, it's, uh, it's my job. I have to to do it. Uh, the other viewpoint is that, uh, the, as, as Janos said, uh, once I stop, uh, for example, when I leave uh, for vacation, I, I find urgent to, <laughs> to start again, and uh, vacations are very the, the, the very good moment to, to do math. And uh, also because I, I got uh, children, and uh, after each uh, pregnancy, I found it was a uh, sort of absolute necessity that I come back to, to math and uh, the question of, of really of uh, uh, vital, vital question for me to, to, to come back to, to math. Uh, I must say that when I was pregnant, uh, you know, you, you, you are making a baby, so you, you are doing something, so maybe it's not necessary to also do mathematics. But um, then I, after the pregnancy, I always came back very, very quickly uh, to math uh, as if it was uh, saving my life or uh, something very, very vital. And so, no, I never really st think uh, stopping uh, doing math. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yes, that's wonderful. I want to ask Pro Pro uh, Professor Janos Kola, is a, is a straight line also a conic? Um, well, <laughs> and so I th think not by the usual definition, yes. And so the, the straight line is a line and, and the conic is a degree two curve. That is the common definition. Yeah, so it is not. But actually, it can be rea but actually it can be rearranged to to form an equation of the uh, of the form of a corner as as mentioned in your lecture. <laughs> it can actually uh, it can actually become uh, become a x plus b y whole whole squared after after expanding it it will it will form the form of equation that fits uh, that fits the requirement. Why you say it's not? <laughs> <laughs> and so my so, so the cheating answer would be that, uh, that the wavy count that he, that if you have a line but you but you count it twice that's a conic. Professors, I know you are very great mathematicians, and as Adolf once said, uh, a mathematician is a machine for turning coffee into theorems. So, do you drink a lot of coffee? Um, actually, I don't like the taste of coffee, so I never drink coffee. So, I'm a, I, I think I'm a different type of mathematician. <laughs> So, uh, me, I am extremely uh, nervous, uh, naturally, so I cannot uh, drink uh, coffee. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
But uh, yeah, something else that would be like tea or uh, why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good idea. I, uh, it's not a good idea. No, uh, no. If if it uh, if something existed that uh, gives you more ideas, I, I think I will take it. But uh, <laughs> so turning know, coffee yeah. into theorem is not a theorem; it's just an example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other? Yes. May I know some application of your research? Do you think that your research is very useful in the real world? Application. Um, and so I think if you would you, you would like to build a five-dimensional building that has lots of circles, then I can tell you the best way to do that. <laughs> so. Um, Personally, I don't pay uh, much attention to applications. I, I always thought that uh, mathematics is very important, uh, not only because uh, it is uh, helpful to, to other sciences, uh, but, but simply in itself, because, uh, to my knowledge, it's uh, the only science where you, uh, you know that uh, things are uh, absolutely true. Uh, it's also uh, a science where you are totally free uh, working on uh, objects, uh, maybe that not you have defined, but uh, your, uh, your colleagues, your, uh, so you, you are part of an incredible uh, history where there is a lot of uh, freedom to, to invent the, 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 the right objects, the, to ask the, the right, right uh, questions. But at the same time, we, we, we have this, um, this absolute necessity of uh, giving something which is true. And uh, I, I think the, this, uh, this, um, the fact that uh, in math, we, we need to prove the statement that, that makes uh, mathematics totally uh, unique and necessary for me in itself. And uh, of course, if, if there are applications, it's, uh, it's welcome. But it's another, uh, it's another uh, completely different uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of mathematics. And I think that even if you discuss with applied mathematicians, the only difference is the fact that for, for applied mathematicians, it's much easier to communicate. And some fields, I think we, we are uh, some, somehow disabled by the fact that we, we work in algebraic geometry, so it's very hard to communicate. As a, the idea, some fields like uh, dynamics or partial differential equation, it's much easier to communicate, to say, well, uh, the, the objects are related to this and this. But it's, uh, it's uh, just a matter of communication. Because if you, in fact, if you discuss with, a, with an applied mathem mathematician who, who doesn't try to, to sell you to do some marketing of his field, you, you will realize that he is a mathematician, like a pure mathematician. And he's, Obsession is not to make mistakes and to prove uh, to prove uh, theorems. So, um, in conclusion, I, uh, I don't see many applications, but who knows? Uh, also, you should not forget that uh, maybe the, st the, the theorems that, uh, that we prove uh, are not used directly, but uh, surely uh, the methods that you will develop, or maybe some obscure elements that we needed, uh, will be useful someday. So it's. Uh, uh, we are part of a very coherent uh, history which, which uh, cannot stop and uh, we, you, you cannot remove uh, a part saying this is useless. We, we don't know. I think uh, sooner or later there will be applications. All right. Well, any other uh, questions? Thanks a lot for your lectures. Uh, so um, I want to ask some questions uh, regarding to your academic career. So I really want to know whether your academic career is uh, very smooth. If it's truly smooth, how you succeeded to uh, do that? And if it's, it's not, then what do you do during the, those hard times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So my career has been, been, been smooth. So, um, <laughs> so I, yes. I had sort of one problem, so that so after the undergraduate degree, I wanted to go to graduate school, and then originally I 
like to go to Moscow. Uh, but, but they failed me on the Marxism-Leninism exam. And so then instead of ending up, they are going to the United States. So I think that for sort of six months, I sort of really didn't know, know what to do. But, but sort of after that, I think it has been smooth. So, so you, 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 you regret not going to Moscow? Well, uh, I was very happy going to the U.S. It, 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 it worked out very well, and uh, but but maybe now I should I should go to go to China now with all these problems in the United States. So. <laughs> My, my career has been very, very easy, very smooth. Uh, in, in France, uh, the, 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 the teachers, the professors at the university, the researchers, they are all uh, employed by, by state. So once you, you enter the system, and uh, me, I got a permanent position uh, once I finished my thesis at, uh, at uh, 2024. 20, then you, you are safe. Your, your, your life continues, and your, it's, um, it, it has been really uh, very important for me uh, to uh, to have a permanent position um, from the beginning, and uh, never to, to worry about uh, practical um, issues. Uh, um, I think that. Uh, Mm, so the most most uh, people in France um, uh, have uh, this uh, this uh, security. Uh, of course, you have to enter the system to get a position, uh, and that, that is more and more difficult because of uh, less positions, less money, and various uh, troubles. But uh, our system is uh, makes uh, a priori uh, the life of uh, researchers. Uh, uh, easy on, on the practical uh, practical side. All right. So I think uh, time is about uh, uh, right. And uh, thank you all for uh, asking so many interesting questions. And thank you uh, both of uh, Lauren to give some insightful opinions. Yeah. Thank you, all professors. Please stay for a moment. May I invite Professor Andrew Chan, the head of Shaw College, to present souvenirs to our speakers. Professor Chan, please. So, may I first invite Professor Janos Kola. and Professor Claire Fassai. And finally, our moderator today, Professor Colin Learn. <laughs> Thank you all professors, and please take a brief photo. Thank you very much.